And that leads me into my last number I want to talk about, which is 5 to 10%. And that's the income percentile around the world that I was sitting at. So I was in the top 5 to 10% of income earners, probably around 6 or 7, depending on how you calculate it. I was in the top 6 or 7% of income earners in 2021 after I gave half my money away and after taxes as well. And that to me is, is mind-blowing. Like even after all that money I gave away, I was still earning significant in the global scale. I was doing pretty well. Hello, everyone. Hello, the It's Never About Money community. Really excited today to have a bit of a different episode. You'd think, why would Joe decide to get a medical practitioner or a doctor onto the It's Never About Money podcast? And um, there's a very, very uh, real reason. And we know that I've been on about and been banging on about the fact that uh, we're really looking at the intersection of money and meaning in this particular uh, podcast. And really, when I think of Henry Howard, who is a doctor, a medical officer at Barwon Health, I think about really the fact that he's been able to um, balance career with financial security and community outreach. And those things are very challenging to be able to do. And I really wanted to explore those ideas with Henry. Hi, Henry, and welcome to um, the pod. Hello, Joe. Thank you so much for having me on. How are you going? I know that you uh, just finished work. That's, that's right. That's right. No, it's going really well. Had a good day. So good, I'm, currently, good. I'm currently here. We're sitting, sitting in um, the office on level nine. Welcome. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, was, um, I want to get straight to it. You, you gave 50% of your income away in 2021 and yeah. actually more in some, in, in some ways uh, more uh, pertinent that you've decided to give away 10% of your income um, to charity for the rest of your career. And when we think about the fact that you're about 30, I think, is, if that's not, if I'm right. That's exactly right. Yes. Um, um, and you, you're precisely right. So I gave, I gave 50% of my income away in my first year. That was, that was my mm -hmm. shtick. And then uh, I've decided, promised even, and you can hold me to it, Joe, that uh, I'm going to give 10% <laughs> of my income away for the rest of my life. And I think if I was to explain to you why I did that, uh, and people may fairly ask why, in the hell, I, I that is my question. That. That is my <laughs> <Yeah. next> question. <laughs> I think I'd like to explain with a few numbers to start with, um, and and the first number I want to talk about is three hundred and fifty thousand, and that number is the approximate number of of children that die every year from malaria. Sorry to start off a bit dark. Um, malaria is a preventable disease. It mainly affects um, tropical regions, um, particularly developing countries. It's malaria born, so it's spread by mosquito. It's, it's mosquito born, sorry, so it's spread by mosquitoes. People get infected, they get this parasite, uh, makes them sick, has about a 1% fatality rate, um, which is not very low, but so many people get infected that it amounts to an enormous number of people dying every year. You can prevent it by stopping people from getting bitten by mosquitoes using either mosquito nets or insecticide treatment. Um, and you can treat it fairly easily. And I know this from personal experience. I've been treated for malaria myself. Um, and you can treat it fairly easily, except that it costs about $400 a treatment. And that's just simply out of reach of some health systems around the world. So 350,000 people, you know, mainly children, uh, die of this disease every year. And I, that keeps me up at night a little bit, Joe, I'll, I'll admit. And then the other number, another number I want to talk about is 500,000. Uh, and that's the number of children that die every year of diarrhea related diseases. And how that happens is you end up, you drink a, you know, unclean water source, get an infection, get gastro basically. Um, you get incredibly dehydrated. They don't get fluid replacement and these children die. And that's an enormous number of children every, every year. And that's just, that's not just 500,000 children. That's 500,000 families every year who grieve the loss of a child. That's unimaginable really. And so between these two And complete, diseases, completely preventable. It yeah, is it, like right. almost entirely preventable and, and mostly treatable yeah. as well. So you can either prevent it by mosquito nets or like sanitation systems. You know, very few people get like severe cholera or anything in Australia because we have very clean water systems. Or you can treat it as well. Like the treatment for malaria is just quite expensive, but it's, it's very effective. And the treatment for diarrheal diseases is actually very simple as well. It's mainly 
it's in a s essence like medical Gatorade, you know, just electrolyte replacement. Um, so th those really affect me, the idea that there's so many people dying unnecessarily of, of treatable diseases. Um, another number I want to talk about is 10,000. 10,000 US dollars is approximately the median household income around the world. So if you took all of the households in the world and you, you split them all up into, into halves, um, half of them would earn less than 10,000 US dollars a year. That's that's about 15,000 Australian dollars, current exchange rates. And that's even accounting for like, it's, it's in actually in international purchasing power parity dollars. So it's trying to account for the fact that, you know, rent and food is probably cheaper in Mali than it is in Melbourne. But yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. an iPhone costs the same, essentially. So, you know, certain things are cheaper, certain things are the same. But in essence, like, you know, half the world is living on even less than 15,000. I mean, I don't know about you, but it, after rent, if I had $15,000, like I'm going to be eating a lot of plain rice and, uh, you know, oats for, for, for dinner. There's just, it's just not a lot of money. And I think it really does put into context for me how, how fortunate I am um, to be earning what I, what I am earning and have had the opportunity to do that. And that leads me into my last number I want to talk about, which is uh, 5 to 10%. Um, and that's the, the income percentile around the world that I was sitting at. So, so I was in the top 5 to 10% of income earners, probably around 6 or 7, depending on how you calculate it. I was in the top 6 or 7% of income earners in 2021 after I gave half my money away and after taxes as well. And that to me is, is mind-blowing. Like even after all that money I gave away, I was still earning like significant in the global scale. I was doing pretty well. Um, and so I, I just hope that those numbers, I think, just maybe provide a bit of context for the conversation and, and, and maybe that will make some of the listeners um, understand that I'm not, I'm not completely mad. There is a method to the madness and there's a, there's a logic behind it. Yeah, I think anyone listening to this would, would clearly understand from a cognitive perspective the reasons why one would want to address these issues. Um, <laughs> the question that I have is more around the emotional aspect of things. What makes mm. you, I mean, there's a difference between awareness and actually care. Um, yeah. And the aspect of care is what interests me because you've said just now that it affects me. Hmm. So to be able to do something to such an extent, um, hmm. giving away 50% of your income, as an example, 10% ongoing into perpetuity, like that is, that is significant. Why do you care? Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like what, what, what is it? Is it what has happened in your background? Um, I mean, you've got the experience as a doctor. I understand that that gives you these awarenesses, awareness of all these preventable issues that are out there. What can you say in your background has kind of created that, that need to do something about it? Yeah, I think that's such a good question. And, and there's so many things. I think going back to the very start, I was born in Australia and I think I've always been very cognizant that, being born in Australia is, you win the birth lottery when you're born in Australia. Like what a great country to be born in with the, the security and the wealth and the access to education and health services. Like it's overall a pretty fantastic place to be born. And more than that, I was born to my parents and my parents are amazing people. They're both really educated, they're kind, they're intelligent, they were loving. They, you know, raised me to be um, a kind, loving, gentle person myself. And they really imbued in me this idea that, um, you know, life is not about just kind of getting as much stuff for ourselves as possible. They, they just kind of gently imbued this idea in me that life is really about making the world better for everyone, not just ourselves. Could I tell you exactly why that's, that's true from first principles? I, I, don't, I don't think I can, but I do genuinely believe that, that, that that's true. Um, I suppose that logic is, is also the logic behind the, um, you could use the prisoner's experiment that, you know, that theoretical logic thought experiment to kind of justify that, you know, and that's that logic experiment is all about how um, if you have two people, um, you know, and they can either behave cooperatively or they can kind of behave um, adversarially, the end result is always the best. It's always optimal kind of on the whole if people just cooperate together. Um, I do kind of feel that deeply and I, I am, I'm running on that assumption at the very least. Um, I think there were a lot of other experiences over my life that, that have really influenced um, the way that I see the world and how I want to behave. And, and a big part was studying medicine. 
And when you do study medicine, you do just come across such an enormous broad range of society. And you really do realise, you know, I I don't think I realised what a bubble I grew up in, in, in inner city Melbourne. And, and once you're out there seeing people from all around the place, experiencing all sorts of things, you really do realise, wow, like some people have been through the absolute wars, you know, and some people have dealt with some really serious stuff, even just in our country. And, and, and that's in Australia, you know, and then you, you extrapolate yeah. that to the rest of the world and it's, it's incredible. So I, I think probably... So- the place I was born, my parents and, and the mm. education that I've had and the experiences and the people I've met, those are probably the, the big three for what's influenced me and what's really made me care. Do you, do you have any, do you have any insights as to why we, why as Australians, we tend to lose perspective on how fortunate we are, even income wise. And also just around you, we've talked previously around um, offline about the medical field and how doctors can lose their, their, their way a little bit in the sense mm. of well being lose perspective on how fortunate they are. Um, do you have any sort of ideas about why that might be the case? Yeah, I mean, certainly it's a protective thing. Like if if you could, if, if we could understand like all the awful stuff that's happening in the world at the moment, we'd, our minds would explode, like we'd melt, you know, it wouldn't, you can't possibly be thinking about this stuff 24-7 because you'd just be a mess, like you couldn't function. Yeah. So on a certain level, yeah. compartmentalising the world um, is necessary and we can't just be, um, you know, being moping around all the time about how horrible the world is. That's just not a functional way to live. So you need to be a bit sensible about it. And yes, I do feel that maybe some people, you know, tend to go a little bit far with that and sometimes maybe lose perspective a little bit. And certainly in the tea room at lunch at the hospital, you do hear a few <laughs> conversations where you think, you know, do you really do you really need to be buying the second BMW? You know, the first one's still working pretty well. Like, do we need? Did, did you really need the second Louis Vuitton handbag? Like, do you need the thirty foot yacht? Would the twenty foot yacht be be good enough? No, and I do. You do see a lot of conversations where people are genuinely saying, and they're generally getting quite anxious, saying like, "Well, this other specialist, this other doctor is making more money than me." Um, you know, am I doing something wrong? Like, like, am I not billing properly? Am I not working hard enough? I, it's so easy to kind of lose that perspective when you when you are just kind of in your own little bubble, and you're you're just only thinking about kind of uh, the people immediately around you. It can be um, it can be an easy way to lose perspective. So you need some kind of balance in between those two. Not thinking about the problems of the world so much that you are crippled by the you know crushing horror of it all um but somewhere between that and um needing the third yacht you uh you need to find a little yeah. kind of balance i think reminds me a little bit of empathy burnout right the fact that there's yeah. so many uh causes out there that is um you know that clearly we'd like to be able to address but the the, mere, the sheer volume and the the diverse nature of it, it almost it almost crushes you into uh into procrastination um, well, have that's, you had, that's a, right. had a way of being able to combat that? Yeah. <laughs> the way of combating um, empathy burnout. Yeah. I, I suppose I try and you say. Are a doctor, a, 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 I was yeah, going to say, as a doctor, you are, you are, you are, so you are a, you're in a profession that requires some degree of empathy and humanity. And at the same time, you're having to do that on a replicable basis. So if anyone has any um uh, suggestions around how to deal with MPP burnout, I imagine a doctor would. <laughs> yeah, except doctors struggle with it a lot and, and it's a, a daily conversation, the conversation about burnout. And I don't know that we have figured out um, how to solve that problem. And it's something that we talk about a lot and that there's a lot of services, you know, nowadays that the hospitals offer for, for tackling burnout because it is so common, you know, um, seeing people suffering all the time and feeling a kind of responsibility to do something about that can be pretty crippling. And that uh, extends perfectly cleanly to, to charity and trying to, you know, help the problems around the world. Have I found a way to combat it? I'm, I'm not sure. I think my way of combating it is giving 50% of my income away and then promising 10% for the rest of my life. Like I take it very seriously, this idea of, of trying to do uh, as much as I can to actually make the world better and trying to be really smart and effective about it. And I think that's what my way of kind of combating the um, the crushing pressure of it all because I can kind of take a load off at the end of the day and say, look, I am doing as much as I think I probably reasonably can 
Um, I just worked a day and over the course of that day, 10% of the money that I just made is going to go to a great cause. And I think that's that's probably my way of, maybe that's not the best way to deal with empathy burnout is, <laughs> I don't know, more empathy or something, but, but it, it works for me. What about the choice of a great cause? Um, yeah, and that's, how that's so one, hard. How does it's, one choose one over the other? Oh, and yeah. I mean, how do you even start with that? And I actually listened to your episode yesterday with um, Jess Bowman and, and, um, yeah. and Kylie Wallace. It was fantastic. And I think those are two really amazing Thanks. people. And, and, you know, for any of the listeners out there that haven't listened to uh, Joe Stefan's <laughs> episode with Kylie Wallace and Jess Bowman, I really encourage you. Thanks, Thanks Henry. Thanks, Henry. I needed that. You know, you know I need that. <laughs> um, and, no, it's great. So so those two, uh, they're running Seedling and they're, it's a basically a ch- charity analysis service and um, yeah. they advise people on, you know, what sort of charities align with them and what works for them. Um, and it's a lot of the core of what they do is trying to analyze which charities are doing really good work with your money instead of, you know, wasting it. Um, and that's, that's a real problem. Like trying to figure out which charity to give to is super tricky. And I think yeah, it it's, is. It's so off-putting and difficult that a lot of people just kind of give up and, and don't even try, which is a pretty reasonable response because it's tricky. And you don't want to give yeah. to a charity that is actively doing bad. That, that's a really scary idea. And there are charities out there, they're like that. And I know Jess Bowman actually has that really interesting story um, about, I think, a volunteerism opportunity. You know, volunteerism is this term we use to describe mainly like young, uh, good-intentioned university kids. And I remember being... Um, advertise these opportunities in my first year of studying. Yeah. Um, and it's, you kind of, you pay, you know, an airfare, you pay the service uh, and, and they'll take you to a place in the world where people aren't doing so well. And then you'll do a little bit of kind of pretty tokenistic activity, like playing with some um, supposed orphans, though I think in Jess Bowman's story, maybe they turn out, it turns out that things aren't quite what they see, that they <laughs> seem to be. But you, you play with some orphans or you, lay some bricks for a, a local, you know, new school building or something. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it's a little bit kind of, a little bit patronising maybe, um, a little bit paternalistic. Mm-hmm. People are kind of going in without a lot of local knowledge. I think people over there feel a little bit kind of degraded by it. There's a whole lot of problems with it. But at the core, like, what is the impact? Really well-intentioned. What's the impact? And that's the real question at the end of the day. And is there a better way to do it? Um, and, and in a lot of cases, it would probably be better uh, for um, young, enthusiastic university students to, instead of actually going over there themselves, probably just give the money from that airfare ticket to a local charity in the area, you know, maybe a local workman who can lay the bricks or a local childcare worker who can look after the kids um, for you. There's, and, and in that way, you're kind of empowering the local community. So often actually like looking for charities that are on the ground that are doing really effective work instead of just going and doing it yourself is, is a great, great thing to do. Um, I, I think yeah. I'd like to shout out probably a few of the services that I use to try and find effective charities. And a huge one for me sure. is, is the life you can save. And The Life You Can Save is, it's an organisation, but it's also a book. And it was written by Peter Singer. And Peter Singer is an Australian philosopher. And he talks a lot mm-hmm. about effective giving and, and the opportunities that we have as people living in probably the wealthier parts of the world. The often underestimated power we have to make positive change in the world by just giving up um, small amounts of money that maybe we don't necessarily need. Um, and he set up this organization called The Life You Can Save, and they recommend all these charities um, all around the world, mostly in developing countries, because often that's where the real opportunities are for, for change for not a lot of money. And um, they recommend all sorts of great organizations. The Fred Hollows Foundation is one. They, they do cataract surgery. You know, they give people their sight back for like $25. Yeah, incredible. Is often, is it often like incredible. their average. It's, it's amazing. Mm. They, um, they support mm. the Against Malaria Foundation, uh, which distributes bed nets. I was kind of talking about bed nets before as a, as a good way to prevent the terrible disease that is malaria. Um, they yep. support all sorts of fantastic organizations. The Malaria Consortium does chemo prophylaxis. They give people medications so they don't get malaria. There's the Helen Keller International Organization. They treat vitamin A deficiency. I really recommend anyone go and look up uh, the life you can save just to even get a sense of kind of what charities are out there because they're really it's really exciting actually i think the kind of stuff you can do and and when it comes to 
changing someone's life, like really transforming someone's life or even saving someone's life, uh, you know, you're talking about a matter of a few hundred or a few thousand dollars. And that is, I mean, it's astounding really to think that you can have it that is. kind of impact for that amount of money. Um, and I, I, I just think about that all the time. <laughs> for sure. For sure. So, 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 I mean, on the, on the kind of track that we were, you, you know, promoting uh, one of the other episodes, I actually was thinking mm -hmm. about um, uh, careers and, and, you know, two people that I've spoken to, Christine Core, which is in another episode, and also mm -hmm. Dan Cumberland from the Meaning Movement. They talk about trying to, if, if a career is not, um, not providing you a direct line to meaning, to change mm -hmm. the way you frame to frame it, you know, um, when it when it comes to um, some occupations, uh, Dan Cumberland was talking about the fact that sometimes meaning is really difficult to find. Now, in in being a doctor, you've got a direct line to meaning. You've got patients; they they have an illness. You help them with their illness. It's an amazing job. You could forgive. I could forgive you for thinking, well, job well done. There's no need for any additional meaning. But you've actually gone further than that and, and starting to contribute in the way you are with your income. So the question that I really have is, do you think that being doing what you're doing could really assist um, uh, that sort of formula, that sort of strategy could be used for others who are probably struggling with meaning in, in, in the work that they do? Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think that's what's really nice about the idea of earning to give is often what it's called, this idea of just kind of, doing a job, doing a normal job, doesn't have to be saving people's lives every day, but then just giving a portion of that income to great causes. And it's it's so, such a universal idea. You can apply it to any possible career. You know, you don't have to be out there in the field doing the cataract surgery yourself. You can be at home doing anything. You can be a, you can be a financial planner. You can be a, a doctor. You can be a lawyer. You can be a, a teacher and, and anyone can be making incredible change or those all of those people are, are often making incredible changes themselves um and I, I, it's it's so kind of extensible and, and universal and applicable i just think it's it's a really nice idea that maybe is a little bit undervalued um and i say that in well aware that the idea of giving 10 percent of your income to charity is not new i didn't invent it you know it's called a tithing and it's existed for thousands of years well aware of that <laughs> well aware of that um, and, and various cultures around the world have a, have a culture of giving as well. I know there's, there's one in Islam, there's a, a principle of Islam is zakat, which is giving 2.5% of your, your wealth, I believe, actually, um, to charity every, every year. It's like a self-imposed wealth tax. It's pretty interesting. Um, so the idea of giving a portion of your income to charity is a pretty, pretty long-standing, but I think it's a winner. And I think it's um, something we should all kind of try and bring into the modern day and think about bringing into the modern day. And the, the other benefit yeah. I might point out about mm -hmm. kind of using your career uh, as a way to, to raise funds is that often it's actually a way more effective way to raise money than a lot of standard fundraising opportunities. Like you think about a bake sale or like a fun run or something. I mean, these are great because they build community kind of support and, and, and people all get around a cause and it's beautiful. But at the end of the day, like I'm not that good at running a marathon. My baking's okay, but you know, it's not gonna like win any prizes at the show. So probably my best way of making money, I think I, the, the most money I could make in a day is by working here and then giving that money to charity. And that's quite a cold, I think some people might see that as a bit of a cold kind of calculating attitude. But at the end of the day, I, I, I do wanna make positive change and I'm, I, if, I think if you're really interested in making, um, like maximizing fundraising, I think seriously consider the idea of, of giving a portion of your income to charity. Well, I think it's a piece in the puzzle, right? You know, when people, you think about people doing, undertaking jobs that they really perhaps even dislike, but they do it for their family as a matter of meaning. Um, mm. And then you have these other potential um, factors can be added to add to the meaning pot. This is really, really helpful where people feel maybe they've been institutionalized. They're good at what they do in their job. They don't love it. I mean, they could change it, but if they're not going to change it, they could change the framing of why they do it. And mm. so this is just another another tool in the toolkit is the way I would kind of put it. But I just wanted to describe or maybe even explore the idea with you around this idea of a higher evolved form of selfishness, the idea of an, I like to think about it like an altruistic selfishness, something yes. that you can 
you know can we can we explore that idea here <laughs> i i've always thought you know the term altruism to me i i don't know that i can use that to describe myself because i i do this because i love it and i i give i give my money away because i don't know that i can be happy without doing it and i suppose in a form in a way that's a form of selfishness yes like can you ever do something without it having some kind of benefit to you probably probably not um i would like to think that doesn't undermine why i do it you know i i think you can be selfish in a lot of ways um i think maybe i'm being a little bit selfish in that yes i am giving to charity because it makes me feel good yes um but i think if we can maybe channel our you know selfish urges into doing really positive things for the world um i'd really encourage more people to do that instead of cha- channeling that you know uh, self interest maybe into less positive things um like like uh, handbags and luxury cars yeah so if we suggest that we are all inherently self interested in some way shape or form and that's our natural predisposition predis- predisposition as humans then perhaps we can just direct it in such a way that actually has a positive impact on others. Yeah, and I think I'd probably go back to the the old uh, prisoner's dilemma thought experiment, you know, and and in that experiment you have you have two people who really both just want the best outcome for themselves. And and it turns out that probably the best way to achieve that is if everyone is kind of just you know um in good faith uh, trying to do the best thing for everyone, and I do think that extends to the rest of society. I think uh, the societies that function the best and that are probably the nicest to live in are ones where there's high levels of trust, you know, and 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 we can generally trust that people have probably you know generally good interests. Um, like like generally they're not going to injure us if if we um, turn our backs. Um, I think that that's really important, and I think you can almost from a selfish level uh justify cooperation working together and um making the world a better place just because it makes the world a nicer place to live for you as well as for everyone else let's go from selfishness to ego mm. um the idea that you are giving a fairly significant amount of your income away is one thing mm. a whole another thing to actually get up on socials and tell people that you're doing it Yeah, that's right. Is was this a was this a ploy to pad up your ego? Absolutely, Joe. Yep, that's what it was all about. You caught me. <laughs> you did get me. Yeah. So no, I, it's it's an obnoxious thing to do. You know, objectively, just going on social media and and, and going on and on. I, so I would make videos every every time I had a paycheck, and I'd explain you know the charities that I'd chosen and, and why I was giving to, um, you know, this or that charity. Um, and the reason I did that was was because. I want to normalize the idea of giving. I think a big part of the reason that more people don't give is that it's just sometimes not something that we think about. It's easy to kind of um forget that there's a lot of people in the world in a lot of need and it's also easy to forget that um there are great charities out there that we could support. That not all charities are a bunk and a waste of time. There are great ones out there that we could support. So I kind of just wanted to remind people. I, I desperately wanted to remind people that you know, this is an option like giving away large amounts of your money is like is actually feasible you can do it so mm. don't like mm. at least come up with a reason in your minds as to as to why why not to do it instead of not thinking about it at all but yes no it's a, it's a um it looks bad i suppose like like advertising that's, yourself that's on social it. media it's really it is hard and it's i struggled with that because i didn't want people to think i was just trying to you know buff up my resume or make people think i was a really good boy um but that's i guess that that's the risk i knew i was taking and i just i think ultimately at the end of the day it would have been less effective to keep mm. quiet do the noble thing you know climb the mountain mm. tell no one do the noble thing and and for no one to know about it yes very noble and good but at the same time i want people to know that this is what i do because i want people to know it's something that they could do as well well there's an enjoyment in 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 knowing that you're giving without others knowing so the fact that, that you true. are doing it the fact that you are doing it those that think about giving and and do it you know reasonably regularly know that there's an integrity in not actually suggesting and just doing the good deed and in sitting in bathing in your glory right mm. but what what is harder and the cost there's a cost in 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 telling others and the cost is that you know that they could be perceiving 
it is an ego play when you know that you're doing it for the impact, for the fact that you could change some social expect- uh, social norms. Um, and, and that's what you're trying to do, right? So mm. I actually think in, in a way, it's, it's a very, very selfless situation because if it was purely self-motivated, you would do your thing and you would sit there and think to yourself, how good is this? I, that's an interesting way to swing it. I don't know that I'm going <laughs> to, I'm not going to get on social media and try and argue that too, too hard. I think, I'll, I think I'll maybe part you. of it, I'll do it for you. <laughs> part of it is that I have to believe, I think that it is a little bit obnoxious getting on social media, because if I didn't believe that, I think it, it probably would be, it probably would be a problem. But yeah, no, I think, I think you're right. I think there's, if, if just from a purely impact perspective, it's important to advertise yeah. what you're doing. And I encourage people to, to when they give, when they're doing giving, like, yeah, be loud about it. Talk about it. It's not about making people feel bad. It's not about making people feel guilty. It's not about making you feel good. It's about, let's just like normalize a culture of giving stuff we don't need, of, of living simply, giving effectively. I think that's what it should all be about. Yeah. So, so coming back to the equation of all the things that I list about meaning, you know, family relationships, um, basic survival needs on the, one, on the one ledger and then money on the other ledger. One of the things that is interesting about this whole thing, and maybe some some people would suggest that, you know, it's it's good enough to say, you know, give my wealth away, but what about our basic survival needs? So there's the whole Maslow's hierarchy of needs situation. Um, I would say that the conversation that we're having is probably one that you would agree um, only occurs this sort of strategy where your basic survival needs are met. But the question is, what is basic survival need? And I wanted to talk about that with you. Yeah, that's a a super tricky question because if you look around the world, there's, you know, how many billions of people living on less than $2 a day? Like what is basic survival at the very, at the very basic level? It's, um, it's like enough food and water and, and shelter to, to get you through. But that's not, I mean, that's not really quite good enough in my personal opinion. Um, it, but mm-hmm. I think one thing that you do learn when you start looking into this is just how uh, malleable, how relative it all is. Like what is considered a livable life in, uh, you know, a slum in Karachi in Pakistan or something is, is quite different to what's considered a livable life in uh, Brunswick, in Melbourne. Um, the, the human experience is really, it's, the spectrum is enormous and human mm. humanity's ability to like normalize um, what their life is and to adjust and to become um, used to what's going on is is pretty amazing. Like even in the hospital, the lives that some people live are pretty it just so so different, and to pe- people kind of just see it as as the norm for them. Mm. And you talk about the fact that the best things in life are often for free as well, which I think is well, a song. absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the best things in life are free, and then I, I say the best things in life are free, and the next best things are really, really cheap. And I do, I do really, really believe that. So if you, you know, the best things in life for me are, are um, family and friends and relationships and love and and kindness, and um, that's that's the best thing of all. And then the next best things are really cheap. Uh, hot chips are cheap. Uh, chocolate biscuits, yeah. cheap, warm baths, yeah. dirt cheap. Um, and those are, those are all the second best things, a nice cup of tea in the sun. Um, and I think if you do, I'm a huge advocate of, of kind of, you know, adjusting one's appreciation uh, for the simple things, you know, and I think we all could probably uh, gain a lot from just um, really savouring the taste of that that mint slice or, or that Tim Tam, you know, it's savouring that, that warm cup of tea, um, because you can easily get on this this hedonic treadmill, you know, this this um, kind of snowball, this rat race of like, oh, I want the next thing, I want the next thing. This is normal now. I need the next best thing. Um, you can just slow down and kind of appreciate mm. the simple things in life, and you can take that to an extreme. You know, you could you could end up in a cardboard box in the gutter, appreciating the simple things. That that is an extreme way to take that. Um, and I'm not mm. advocating for that, by the way. I, I live in a house. I don't no. live in a cardboard box in the gutter. Um, but yeah. I think we could all probably, uh, especially in the hospital, to be honest, especially some of the some mm. of my colleagues, some of my associates, um, could probably 
lean a little bit more towards the appreciating the simple things in life and really considering um, whether you do need the next fancy thing. Mm. So almost detach, detaching ourselves away from detaching ourselves away from the consumerism mentality um, of the world, and almost we're almost objectifying ourselves in such a way to say that we're only a worthy person if we have these certain things, which seems to me to be problematic because you'll never have enough things to actually make yourself yeah, happy. Yeah, so that's right, and there's no ceiling. There's no ceiling on it. You can get no. as much as you want, and there will always be someone more than you, or that you can always have twice as much. Um, and mm -hmm. I think it's, it's not a road to happiness, really. I mean, to go back to being selfish again, if, if all you really want is to be happy, then going down the route of trying to acquire as much stuff as possible, I actually don't think is the right route. I think finding mm -hmm. um, meaning and um, enjoying all those simple things and finding, finding the joys uh, that there are just kind of waiting there under your nose, I think that's actually probably the true path to you know, purely selfish um, happiness strategy. Hmm. What, what did mum and dad say about this decision? Do they think you're crazy? <laughs> yeah, well, um, they, <laughs> they, are, they are incredible. They're incredibly encouraging, actually. They were, look, they, oh, they questioned it a little bit when I was uh, in med school and I decided to go and take part in a clinical trial uh, where I was infected with malaria. Also, I could uh, raise two thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars and then give it to a malaria charity. They did raise their eyebrows a little bit at that one. They weren't necessarily all that pleased, um, but no, they've both been incredibly supportive of, of what I do with this. I think they both they both really get it. And and if they didn't get it, honestly, it would be mostly their fault because they they raised me to believe yeah. that that trying to make the world better for everyone instead of just myself was was kind of the goal. And uh, I yeah. mean, if they, if they don't like it, they stuffed up somewhere along the way, but I think, I think they do really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's great. Well, I, I, I wonder whether, um, you know, whether when you heard about the name of the podcast, um, mm. if anything sprung t to mind uh, when you hear it's never about money, because in some ways, you know, it's a lot about money, what we're talking about at the moment. I know, I know. And that's yeah. the irony, isn't it? Yes. And it the, is, the irony it is, is the that irony. a lot of, I basically just haven't shut up about money for the last, you know, half an hour or whatever. Um, <laughs> but no, I think when I, when I hear the name of your podcast, it's never about money. The key, the subject there is it, you know, and, and what is the it you're talking about? And I think it's pretty clear, or at least to me, that the, the it you're talking about is, is, you know, it's, it's what is life about? What is, what is meaning? Where does meaning derive from? And I kind of, I think if you, if you talk to someone who's, who's nearing the end of their life, and you ask them what what brought you meaning you know what did you find brought you the deep satisfaction of a life well lived the answer to that question is never about money and i think that's to me that's what the the name of the podcast kind of evokes is this idea that at the end of the day yes money can like buy you things but at the end of the day what what really matters is is the kind of the meaning and the satisfaction that you find in life and often those things are, are not about money they're about the relationships mm. you build they're about the people around you they're about the experiences that you've had uh they're about love mm. and friendship and it's all very cliche yeah. and, and cheesy but it's uh as many cliche and cheesy things are it's it's absolutely true i think yeah i think another thing that makes sense to me is that money is always better as the slave than the master it's it's an mm. enabler to help us do things you know so um yeah that's yeah right. absolutely completely agree um and you nailed it i should put that as my uh podcast intro from now on uh henry <laughs> much appreciated that was very eloquent um so when it comes to you know we've talked about uh financial security we've talked about careers we talk about mm. community now do you think we under leverage the power that we have to make change abroad? Do you think our community is actually too narrow in its focus? Yeah, I think so. I think sometimes. So I, um, I recorded all the different charities that I gave to, and I did give to local charities um, in, in Australia or in Victoria. Um, but I also, I gave most of that money overseas. And that was kind of just a practical um, decision based on the idea that a lot of places overseas are doing a lot worse than Australia. Um, 
And the kind of bizarre nature of international exchange rates kind of does mean that often the Australian dollar has an enormous amount of value in other parts of the world. And, and you can do pretty amazing things um, in the international space that you sometimes can't really do in Australia. And there are great charities in Australia, and I, I have given to a lot of them. And I, I think um, Jess Bowman and Kylie Wallace, I think Seedlings, um, a lot of its focus is is in Australia. I think they do do some inter- international stuff as well. They do, um, they but do, I, do international as well. Yeah. yeah. And I, I am super encouraging to people looking a bit more abroad. You know, I, I do understand people wanting to kind of support their, support their fellow Aussies and support their fellow countrymen. But I mean, I'm also interested in supporting my fellow humans, supporting my fellow planet men. And um, I think there are enormous opportunities overseas. It can be a bit hairy, you know, like interfering with other countries that there's, you know, questions that are raised about that. But I think at the end of the day, um, no one wants to be dying of malaria. No one wants their child to be dying of preventable diarrheal disease. Everyone wants a decent, you know, uh, opportunity to have a good education. Everyone wants opportunity to live a safe, satisfying life. And I think we can help do that without, you know, uh, facing those kind of problems of paternalism and things because it's a it's a pretty universal desire. Um, so I think there are huge yeah. opportunities overseas and I, I think they are a little bit under leveraged. I think sometimes we underestimate. And it's, it's also because they're out of view, you know. Uh, you see what's going on, on on the news, you know, you see what's going on down the street, you see what's going on the next state over. Um, yeah. If, if the news focused internationally on what's going on, I mean, we wouldn't get any national news, would we? Because every top no. rated story, the full front page and the next five pages would be all about how many people died of malaria or diarrhea or the horrible war that just happened or the invasion or the genocide. Or, you know, it, it's, I understand why people don't look overseas because it's a bit overwhelming and it's nice to look after your fellow local. But I think also... There's massive opportunities and you can look out there and there's great charities out there. And I would recommend, you know, The Life You Can Save. Uh, Give Well is another organisation that looks at mainly international charities. Uh, so, yeah, there's huge opportunities out there. Have a look. So the ability to just, you know, leverage off the back of the uh, the wealth and the fortune that we have here domestically to, you know, our dollar brings about um, amazing change uh, globally in certain in certain countries um, and economies. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, So we've talked a lot about um, community, careers, financial security. What's keeping you up at night uh, at the moment? And what's what's still to do? Um, I was up pretty late the other night um, looking at... What was going on in in Turkey and Syria after the um, most recent earthquake? I mm. uh, felt uh, I was pretty horrified by that, you know. And there were people uh, you you just knew. I was sitting on my couch and I knew that that on the other side of the planet uh, there were people trapped in rubble, and that's really disturbing. Um, I can't. There's no charity I can give to to stop earthquakes, Joe. Unfortunately. Um, but there are charities you can give to to kind of make communities more resilient, perhaps, when earthquakes happen. You know, a lot of there were a lot of building collapses in Turkey, and and I'm always interested in looking at root causes. You know, like how can we really nail down the root cause of what happened? Just sending food to people in Turkey is not going to stop the next horrible natural disaster happening. So how can we make communities more resilient? And I think if you look at it, the answer often comes down to um, general kind of economic, socioeconomic development. Um, Why did all these buildings fall down? Well, it's because, you know, Turkey has maybe struggled a bit to develop um, the same building codes that we have. But why would they? They don't necessarily, not people over there don't necessarily have all the money to build buildings that satisfy all the same earthquake codes that that you might in, say, Mm. Tokyo or something. So Mm. how do we get, you know, how do we then tackle the root cause of that? you go right back, and I think at the end of the day, a lot of a lot of what it is 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 tackling um, health, education, uh, the roots of development, um, and I'm I'm really interested in kind of looking at ways to do that. But I also think that emergency relief is really important as well. And th- and there were charities that I kind of found um, through 
other people in the effective giving community, uh, other charities that were working on emergency relief in Turkey that sounded like they were doing pretty good work. It's always a little bit hard to know when you're dealing on a short time frame. You haven't got, you know, randomised controlled trials to tell you what's working and what's not. Um, but I, I did give to emergency relief in that case as well, just because I, I, I did think it was a, it's an awful thing. And I think it was um, something that you, you could probably be doing something about at the time. Mm -hmm. So, so just to tie this all in, you know, if you were to give us a couple of messages uh, to take away um, from our conversations um, in, in summary, uh, what would those messages be? I suppose my, my primary message is um, I think we could all benefit from a, a philosophy of, of, of simple living and effective giving. I think that's a, it's a wonderful way to live. It really allows us to leverage the opportunities that we have to help people in the world that haven't had the opportunities that we've had. Um, I, I think um, my other message would be, you know, don't be afraid. Like it's, it's a huge world out there, the world of global development, of charity, of trying to solve the suffering in the world. Um, but don't let it put you off. You know, there are, there are avenues you can look at that um, do a really good job of kind of breaking it down and, and finding uh, really effective ways to help. Um, and I, my third message, I suppose, would be just like, don't, don't underestimate the power that we have. Um, even like someone who's on a median income in Australia, like right in the middle of, of the scale of wealth in Australia, is, is I think still in like the top 5% of incomes worldwide. Um, that's, that's enormous, you know, and that gives you an enormous power and enormous leverage to make positive change in the world. And don't, don't underestimate your power. Well, I mean, those are incredible insights and incredible messages. I, I'm very much indebted to you for coming on. I, I, you know, say this in a very genuine way. It's a, uh, it's a real honor to, to do this with you. Uh, as a young man, you're doing amazing things and you're exhibiting great leadership and, um, uh, it's, it's, I'm very, very thankful, uh, that everyone gets to hear, uh, what your journey is so far and, uh, long may it continue. I, I wanted to ask the question that no one, uh, gets, gets away with, um, on this podcast, um, you know, what your spirit animal would be and why you've probably mm. heard that in the last one, given that you do your due diligence. I expected that. Um, what do you think? I, um, yeah, I thought you thought you might ask that one actually, Joe. <laughs> um, and and Joe, I want I want to talk about the penguin, Joe, because the penguin oh, the is penguin. Okay, good. the penguin's my favourite animal, uh, okay. and particularly the fairy penguin. And I okay, I just think they are they're just the sweetest animals. There's there's not many animals that make me almost. I get a little bit choked up actually thinking about the fairy penguins sometimes. To be honest, if you're ever in in Victoria, you should go down to Phillip Island and see the, see the little fairy penguins there. They are yeah, magical cool. animals. Yeah. Um, but what I like about the penguin, I think the penguin has something to teach us about being open to change and adaptability and, you know, finding better ways to be. Because if you look at the evolutionary history of the penguin, um, like us, they, you know, they started out as a fish, some sort of fish, and then a group of those fishes went on to land. They became the first land animals as, as, as our ancestors did. And, and a group of those land animals then went on to become the dinosaurs. So they were in charge for a little while. And then a group of those dinosaurs developed feathers and, and they developed wings and they took flight, you know, adapting, all, always adapting to these changes that are around them. And then for some reason, over millions of years, a group of those birds lost the ability to fly. Their wings turned into flippers. They moved to the most inhospitable place on the planet, Antarctica. And now the penguins are back swimming around in the water and they're eating fish. And I just think there's something so convoluted and beautiful about that pathway and what they've done at every step. What they've done at every step is they've, they've adapted to change. And, and I would really like to think I adopt that feature of the penguin. I, I would like to think I relate to the penguin in that way. I try, and, I try and adapt. If I see a better way of being, I try and adopt that. If, if I realize that I'm wrong in some way, I try and change my opinion. And, and if I see an opportunity, to, to try and make the world a better place, I, I try and take that opportunity. And I think, I think we could all learn something from the penguin in that way, Joe. I think we could all be more like the penguin. 
Uh, absolutely. I always say that if this podcast, no one listens to it, I'm actually speaking to some amazing individuals and I'm, I've got a capacity to change my own personal life. So I'm all, I'm all on board with you, Henry. Um, again, appreciate it, mate. And um, thanks so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Joe. I hope that this one was enjoyable to listen to and there were some moments of value. If you have resonated in any way with the sentiments of this podcast, we would be delighted to direct you to our website, www.itsneveraboutmoney.com.au for more free resources and education aimed at improving your capacity to make sound financial decisions for the benefit of your family. We wish you every success, however you define it.